For the second consecutive season, the championship of the American Football Conference comes down to the same two teams, two bitter rivals, the Oakland Raiders and Pittsburgh Steelers. Over the past decade, no team in pro football has achieved as high a level of success during the regular season as Oakland, an achievement that has now carried them to that last step toward the NFL championship for the sixth time since their last and only appearance in the Super Bowl in 1968. However, with that unparalleled level of achievement has come an unmatched history of agonizing disappointment. The Raiders have had no less than five chances before today to take the final step to the Super Bowl again. They have not made it yet. The Raiders' chances today are less than ideal, for they face the defending champion Steelers on Pittsburgh's home turf. It is tough enough for any team to beat the Steelers in Pittsburgh, for their partisans have been known to literally rock Three Rivers Stadium. And playing before this very vocal and very faithful audience is difficult enough. But when you add the fact that Oakland has never won a playoff game on the road, the Raiders must be considered decided underdogs. But for today's game, you can throw away the history books. The biggest factor may be the weather. 20 degree temperatures and 20 mile an hour winds have turned Three Rivers synthetic surface into an ice skating rink. Freezing faces, freezing feet, and freezing fingers, plus frozen field, equal an uncertain situation for both teams, as the Oakland Raiders face the Pittsburgh Steelers in the NFL Game of the Week for the championship of the American Football Conference. The biggest job for the Raider defense would be to stop Franco Harris, who has a history of big games in the playoffs. They would accomplish this tough task thanks to their new 3-4 defense, with number 83, Ted Hendricks, the fourth linebacker. The new defense was actually forced on Oakland due to injuries in the defensive line, but Hendricks had a big game in Oakland's first-round victory over Cincinnati, and he would play a big role in the Raiders' reduction of the Franco factor in the first half. Hendricks did not make the tackle on this play, but a repeat reveals that he was actually responsible for stopping Harris. Hendricks jammed number 20 Rocky Blyer back into Harris, destroying the timing of the play and enabling the Raider pursuit to bury the big running back. Throughout the first half, Hendricks closed off the left side. On this play, number 83 fought off the block of John Kolb and nailed Harris himself. The 3-4 is dependent on good outside control by the two outside linebackers. And on the right, Phil Villapiano, number 41, was just as effective. With their two outside linebackers closing off Harris to the outside and jamming his cutback moves back into his face, the Raider defense limited Harris to 24 yards on 11 carries. Rocky Blyer got just three yards, but Terry Bradshaw, about whom there was a great deal of concern due to a knee injury suffered last week, was able to move quite well, and he provided almost all of the Pittsburgh offense in the first half with his well-aimed passes. Bradshaw would move the Steelers fairly well, the three interceptions that he threw in the half would limit the Steelers to just three points. Number 78, Art Shell, is an all-pro playing the left tackle spot on the Raiders' offensive line. Next to him is number 63, Gene Upshaw, another all-pro. So it's natural that the Raiders tend to run to their left. Also, by running left, Oakland could avoid Joe Green, L.C. Greenwood, and Jack Ham on their right. But those aren't blocking dummies playing the left side of the Steeler defense either. As Raider coach John Madden said, the Steelers have no weakness. They have no weaknesses because they help each other out. On this play, Oakland attacks left, and right linebacker Jack Ham comes across the entire field to use up a blocker. Russell slows down the running back, and Ernie Holmes, a lineman, makes a hustling downfield tackle.
But as much as anything, Oakland's first half inability to score was due to the condition of the field. Time after time, open Oakland receivers slipped. Of course, they had gotten open because to the receiver goes the advantage in a duel with a defensive back or linebacker on a slippery surface. Both teams were being affected by the weather, and this would lead to a very low-scoring half. Though Oakland's problem appeared to be a field-related nuisance, Pittsburgh's problem was the turnover. A Jack Tatum interception gave Oakland good field position for their second series of the game. And Kenny Stabler improved it with a pop to Mike Ciani. Raiders could not score, but from the Steeler 30, Ray Guy hit a perfect coffin corner shot. Three plays later, from their own five, Jack Tatum claimed his second interception on the Pittsburgh 29. But Tatum's interception and display of disdain were for naught. For when George Blanda attempted a 38-yard field goal, no amount of body English could put the ball through. For the Steelers, it was an important stand, for they completed the first quarter without giving up any points despite two turnovers. And now had gone through 16 straight games the entire 75 season, without giving up a touchdown in the first period. One luxury that Stabler had was immaculate protection. He usually had oodles of time, but could complete just six of 18 first half passes. But along about the second quarter, Steeler pressure became more intense. And L.C. Greenwood may have been telling Stabler not to try that again. For several plays after this one, Mike Wagner made a brilliant interception. Wagner picked a bad place to pick a fight, for he was soon surrounded by silver and black and decided to go the discretion route as far as Valor was concerned. But his interception keyed a short drive that saw Steeler kicker Roy Jarella come through and Pittsburgh gain a three to nothing lead. Both teams had already experienced frozen field problems and the rest of the half became a frozen finger frolic as neither team could catch the ball. same gloves that were keeping Jack Ham's hands warm probably also kept him from an interception. But on the very next play, Clarence Davis did a Jack Ham impersonation and dropped a certain first down pass that probably would have gained quite a lot more. There aren't a lot of Steelers around who could have tackled Davis had he held on. Now it was the Steeler defense's turn again. On Oakland's next series, Stabler threw over the middle for Harold Hart, and Mike Wagner, gloves and all, should have had an interception. Pittsburgh defensemen were not doing much for glove makers of America's stock. About the only people left out of the frozen finger contest was Pittsburgh's offense. And so on their last possession of the half, they joined in when Bradshaw hit Lynn Swan right in the proverbial numbers.
Monty Johnson claimed Swan's bobble and the last scoring chance of the first half was gone. It was fitting that the half should end with the ball in possession of a defensive player, for it had been that kind of half, a defense-dominated half that saw the Steelers holding the slimmest of leads over the Raiders, three to nothing. The stinging cold and icy surface, which had affected both teams about equally in the first half, continued to take its toll in mistakes. There were five turnovers in the third quarter alone, as each team strained for the advantage that would alter the Steelers' fragile three-point lead. Soon after number 58, Jack Lambert recovered the first of the three fumbles he would capture for the day, Lynn Swan gave the ball right back. Swan's bobble was the result of a George Atkinson forearm and Jack Tatum was the man on the ball. Oakland had possession and Lynn Swan left the game never to return. Taking over at midfield, Kenny Stabler rolled right and threw a pass that was tipped by Glenn Edwards, but nevertheless caught at the 35 by Mike Ciani. Despite the fact Oakland had its deepest penetration in quite some time, coach John Madden found something to be displeased about. Two plays later, Madden had even more reason to yell when Clarence Davis coughed up the ball to Lambert at the Pittsburgh 30-yard line. This time, the turnover paid off in a score as the Steelers marched 70 yards in just five plays, their best drive yet by far. The touchdown drive began with a fine catch for 10 yards by Swan's replacement, John Stallworth, and number 41, Phil Villapiano's version of the late, late, late show cost the Raiders an additional 15 for unnecessary roughness. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Franco Harris took Bradshaw's pass in the flat, then flattened a few Raiders to bring the ball 17 yards to the 25. On the very next play, Harris got the remaining 25 yards in one fell swoop. The Steelers have the first touchdown of this cold, cold day. Another look at it shows a fine crackback block by Stallworth and a very poor tackle by Colsey were the prime ingredients in Harris's touchdown run that put Pittsburgh ahead 10 to nothing. Down by 10 now, Kenny Stabler and the Raiders came roaring back for their finest moment of the day. Number 87, Dave Casper, took three consecutive passes to set up Oakland's first and only touchdown. The first was for 23 yards to the Steeler 37. The second was on a fine catch between two defenders for 11 more. On the last reception, watch as the second-year tight end from Notre Dame used his 6'4 height to outjump Mike Wagner. 
Casper had replaced starter Bob Moore, who was injured early in the third quarter and is only one of four tight ends on the Raiders roster. To get an idea of the depth this team has, that fourth is Ted Qualick, the perennial 49er All-Pro. After Casper had taken his third straight reception near the left sideline, Stabler, with time enough to stand and wait patiently, hit the open man, Mike Ciani, for the Raiders' first score. Trailing by three now on their next offensive series, Oakland and Marv Hubbard made their final fatal mistake. Jack Lambert had fumble recovery number three on the Oakland 25. And three plays later, Terry Bradshaw passed that distance to John Stallworth for Pittsburgh's second touchdown. On the Steelers' score, number 57, Sam Davis, made a key block, riding Ted Hendricks around Bradshaw, who snapped his pass right to the spot where number 45, Neil Colsey, another victim of the ice, had stood. A look from behind documents the play and Stallworth's solitary splendor, as Pittsburgh's second touchdown seemingly put the game out of reach of the Raiders. The 6-2 Stallworth is just one of many interesting stories on the Steelers championship team. A fourth round draft choice from Alabama A&M last year, Stallworth became a starter as a rookie. This season he lost that job through a succession of injuries and the return to form of Frank Lewis, who is now the regular. Nonetheless, Stallworth contributed immeasurably to the Steelers' great season. His play on the special teams has been exemplary and his touchdown against the Houston Oilers was the winning one in the big game for both teams. Now through an injury to Lynn Swan, the spotlight was again on Stallworth. And with his fine block that sprung Franco Harris for the first touchdown and his catch here for the Steelers' second, Dave Stallworth was one of the big stories of the day. But with nine and a half minutes left, there was plenty of drama remaining in this AFC championship game. A bad center snap caused Roy Girella to miss the extra point. A full five minutes later, Oakland was still nine points down, but here they got a big break. On third and long, Bradshaw, anxious to keep possession, couldn't find a receiver and tucked the ball in. Thirteen yards later, Terry had a first down, but had been knocked silly doing it and his replacement, seldom used second string quarterback Terry Hanratty, entered the game. Two plays later, Franco Harris lost the ball and Oakland had a new life on their own 35. It was Pittsburgh's eighth turnover of the game. With 1.31 to go in the game, the Raiders' chances were bleak at best, but they quickly moved closer to the Steeler goal line on the arm of Ken Stabler. Cliff Branch, who had been held in check all afternoon, finally caught his first pass of the day, and Oakland was in Steeler territory. With one minute left, Stabler went back, made like a statue for a few seconds, then passed to Dave Casper for 14 yards. When on the next play, Stabler found Mike Ciani for eight additional yards, Oakland used its last timeout. Stabler tried one more pass, which was incomplete. 
Then on third down, coach John Madden elected to go for the field goal since the Raiders needed nine to tie anyway. And from 41 yards out, George Blanda gave it to him, his longest kick of the season. Behind by only six, Oakland's only chance was a successful onside kick. Everyone in Three Rivers Stadium knew it was coming, yet it still worked. Marv Hubbard recovered Reggie Garrett's fumble, and the Oakland Raiders would have one last chance from their own 45. Seven seconds left, one final gasp, do or die. Stabler put the ball up for the 42nd time today, and Cliff Branch came down with it on the Steeler 15. But that was all. Time had run out. The Pittsburgh Steelers had won the rematch and had their second straight conference championship, winning 14 of 16 to do it. The scoreboard told the story. Pittsburgh was in the Super Bowl again.